Okay, these are the solutions to the free response practice. So let's take a look at this first one. These are going to be some of your basic um, solving equations. So we distribute, get rid of our parentheses first. That's kind of the first step you want to do when you are working with an equation. So be careful with the negatives. So I got 4x, I got minus 2, negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4x. Negative 2x times negative 1 is positive 2. Next step was gather my like terms on both sides. So 4x and 4x is 8x. Then I had the minus 2. 12 plus 2 is 14. Minus 2x. I want to move all my x's to one side, so I added 2x to both sides. Gave me 10x minus 2 equals 14. Added 2 and then divided by 10. For the second type, we need to see about cross multiplying. So if you just cross multiply here, we have 15x plus 60 is equal to 20x minus 8. Now again, we just want to move our x's to one side, so I subtracted 15x from both sides, added 8, we get 68 equals 5x then we divide it by 5. You can leave your answer as 68 over 5 or you can give a decimal answer like 13.6. For our system problem, okay we have two different methods. You can use elimination or you can use substitution. This one sets up best for substitution because I could solve for x in this equation then replace it here. So my first step was I added 4y so I have x equals 4y plus 15 took the 4y plus 15 and I plugged it into the x up here. So I have 3 times in parentheses 4y plus 15 is equal to 2y plus 25. Distribute I get 12y plus 45 equals 2y plus 25. Again move my y's to one side so I subtracted 2y I get 10y plus 45 equals 25 Subtract 45 from both sides, you get 10y equals negative 20. Solve for y, you get y equals negative 2. Once I'm finished, I can take the y equals negative 2, plug it back into this equation, and I got 4 times negative 2 is negative 8, plus 15 gives me positive 7. So that means those two lines intersect at the point 7, negative 2. For our factoring, your first step is to see what's in common. I have 3 will go into all those terms. x goes into all of them. So I factor out the 3x. That leaves me with x squared minus 6x minus 4x minus 12. And then if you need to use a box method, we have a couple different ways you can actually work through it. Um, you take the term that's here, which is x squared, and you take the term that's at the end, goes into this box. Then these two multiplied together give me negative 12x squared. So that means these two multiplied together have to equal negative 12x squared but I want them to multiply to give me negative 12x squared but add to give me negative 4x. So I'm looking at primarily the negative 12 and then negative 4. Well ways of getting 12 I have 1 times 12 I have 2 times 6 or 3 times 4. Since the last number is negative I know that one of these is positive one of these is negative. So if I want to get negative 4 if I use the 2 and the 6, I'm going to use 6x and 2x. One of these has to be negative, but I want negative 4x, so this one will be negative. Then I can figure out my factors. I could take out an x here, and x times x gives me x squared. x times negative 6 gives me negative 6x x times 2 
gives me 2x, and then verify it. 2 times negative 6 is negative 12. Make sure that you didn't make a mistake in terms of figuring out these two numbers. So that means it factors to x minus 6 and x plus 2. I still have the 3x out in front. Okay, our flowchart proof. Okay, first thing you want to do is see about marking up your figure. So angle PTO, angle PTO is congruent to angle PTS, PTS. So I marked those with double marks. Then I wrote it into the bubble. That was given. Then I did angle OPT. So that's OPT is congruent to SPT. So SPT, mark those with single arcs. Doesn't matter which way you want to mark them. That also was given, so I just put it into the box and wrote given. We have one more piece of information we need to, need to use, and the two things you want to watch for are vertical angles and reflex it. PT equals itself. So I have PT congruent to PT. That's called reflexive. Now, once I have this done, I have an angle, side, angle, matching this angle, side, angle. This is angle, side, angle. Be careful with angle, angle, side. If I had this angle, this angle, and then the side, that's angle, angle, side. So you have to be aware of what you work with because that's a, probably the most common mistake we have. Okay, so now for matching of our pieces. I have triangle STP is going to match triangle OTP. That's what goes here by angle side angle. And then we final step. That's what's going to go in this box right here. Congruent triangles, therefore congruent parts, or some of you would like to use CP, CTC. So corresponding parts, congruent triangles are congruent. So that's our last step on that kind of a problem. Okay, similar triangles. This one's a little bit harder. We have overlapping triangles. These triangles are similar because we basically have angle angle. This angle matches itself on both triangles. Then these two angles are corresponding. Okay, I've got to match up the small triangle with the large triangle. Now the large triangle, and these things are not necessarily drawn to scale, so I'm going to draw this one over here on the outside. That's representing the entire triangle going around. Well, this side is y plus 8, because y plus 6 plus 2. Down here, I've got x plus 11. Okay, so now I'm going to match up the small triangle that's here with the large triangle, which I just drew off to the side, and then this side right here is 12. Okay, so now we're going to try to match like things. So let's start with the x's. I have the small side, well, this side right here, the x plus 8, is to x plus 11. So this triangle is to this triangle. x plus 8 is to x plus 11, as small side, which is 10, matches the 12. So 10 is to 12. For the y's, I'm going to match up y plus 6 matches up with y plus 8. So you can just look at this and realize, okay, that's y plus 6 over y plus 8. Got to use the whole side. And again, I'm going to use the same two sides that I already know, 10 and 12. Okay, now it's just a question of cross multiplying and solving. So if you cross multiply and solve for this one, you get x equals 7. Solve for this one, end up with y equals 4. It asked you for the perimeter of triangle PQR. So now I've just got to plug in. Well, if x equals 7, PQR was the big triangle. That would make this side 7 plus 11 is 18. Y was 4. This side would be 4 plus 8, so I have 12. So it ends up being an isosceles triangle. This is not drawn to scale. 
So my perimeter is going to be 18 plus 12 plus 12, which is 42. Okay, this is a trig example. So we're going to be using SOHCAHTOA. Now, be careful with this kind of a problem. The statue is atop of a tall pillar. That's the statue. Angle elevation from point 80 feet from the base is 45 degrees. So this is 45 degrees. The angle of elevation from the same spot to top statue is 52 degrees. So when I put these two together, it adds up to 52. That's just labeled as 7 degrees. But I'm not ever going to use the 7 degrees except for to say that I'm going to use it with the 52. It asked why what the height of the pillar was. Well, we don't even need to use trig for this. If this is 45, we have a 90 degree angle here. This is 45 then because the sum of the angles in the triangle have to add up to 180. This is an isosceles triangle. So this side is congruent to this side. So they're going to have the same length. So the pillar is 80 feet. Now you could have also done it, you know, using, you could have done tangent of 45 is equal to the pillar, I'm going to write as P, over 80. And you would have gotten 80, because when you do tangent of 45, it equals 1. OK, for the second part of it, though, I want to know the height of the statue. Well, what I'm going to do is figure out what the height of the entire figure is. And then we're going to take that and add, and then subtract that, the 80, from it. So I'll find out what the height of the statue was. Because the statue plus the pillar is going to be what I'm looking for. So this whole angle here was 52. I have opposite and adjacent, so that's why I'm using tangent. So tangent of 52 is equal to the opposite side, which I called x, over 80. Cross multiply, I get 80 tangent 52 is equal to x. When you do this on your calculator, you get 102.4. The height of the statue, though, is going to be 102.4 minus the pillar, which is 80. So that's how I got 22.4 feet. For the other trig one, we have Amy is flying a kite. She has let out 80 feet of string, so that's where this 80 goes here. The string is 4 feet above the ground, so there's the 4. The angle the string makes with the ground, so it's parallel to the ground in actuality, is 63 degrees. And first step, it asks you to sketch a picture representing the situation. I want to find out what the height of the kite is, and that's this entire height right here. But what I'm going to do first is figure out what x is. So this time, I'm given the opposite side and the hypotenuse. So I use sine. So sine of 63 is equal to x over 80. I get 80 sine 63 equals x. When you solve it, you get 71.3. But that's 71.3 from here. Then we add 4. Gives me 75.3, and that would be in feet. Okay, the last problem is the performance task, and this is our probability problem. Okay, so we have two spinners, and we're going to try to figure out which one you're going to choose. Well, there's two different games basically played. You have one person playing against another, you're going to choose a spinner, and the opponent you're playing with chooses the other. But we have two different games we're basically going to be working with. So the first thing is, we want to see what kind of combinations we have of the two spinners, because that's going to help us to figure out what different parts are. So that's what the first part is. Gave you the one fourth is what this one is, so I know that six is one fourth, eight is one fourth. These got cut in half of a quarter, so they're each an, each an eighth. So those are the probabilities going across here. This is one third, this is one third, bottom one's one third. So they're all a third. So that makes that one a little bit easier. Now the probability of each one, all I've got to do is multiply my numbers. So 1 fourth times 1 third is 1 twelfth. 1 eighth times 1 third is 1 24th. 1 fourth times 1, um, 1 third is 1 twelfth. Again, we get 1 24th and 1 eighth times 1 third. Then 1 fourth times 1 third is 1 twelfth. Since these are 1 third for each of these as well, 
the, these ones will be exactly the same as that first row. Okay, so that's just filling out your table. If it was to add everything up, I would get a total of one. You could always do that as a check if you wanted to. These guys, if I go across this way, have to add up to one third. These have to add up to one third. The columns have to add up to one eighth for this one. This one have to add up to one fourth. So you got one twelfth plus one twelfth plus one twelfth plus three twelfths. That's one fourth. So you can act that as a check too. Okay, first game. It says if the game is played where the higher score wins, which spinner should you choose? Justify your answer. To give you a hint, shade all the squares where spinner A has the higher value than spinner B. So that's what I did. So. 2 is lower than all these numbers, so spinner A would win in all these cases. So this total right here equals 1 third. If I add up all those, I have 1 third. Then right here, 20 wins against all of them, so I don't shade any of those. And then 5, if I have 5, spinner B wins here and here. But spinner A wins in this cell, this cell, and this cell. So I'm going to add 1 12th, 1 24th, and 1 12th. So spinner A wins 1 third, that's the that entire one right here, which you could have added up all those individual ones, plus this 1 12th, the 1 24th, and the 1 12th. Now, if I wanted to do it in a fraction, I could get a common denominator, make them all over 24. So that's 8 24ths, 2 24ths. 1 24th and 2 24th so gives me 13 out of 24. You could have also just added them up and got a decimal answer. The decimal answer for that particular problem, if you did do it as a decimal, would have been 0 0.542. That's over 50% chance, so I should choose A. So spinner A is going to have the higher probability. Spinner B would have been 11 out of 24 because these two have to add to 1, or 0.458 is what that would come out to be. Second game is played where they're going to spin it 10 times and then take their total. So the higher score, now I'm going to look at expected value. So I'm going to figure out the expected value for each one for a single spin and then multiply that answer by 10. So for spinner A, we take our value times the probability, so it's 3 times 1 fourth, 4 times 1 eighth, 6 times 1 fourth, 7 times 1 eighth, 8 times 1 fourth. That's what I have written right here. Just do that on your calculator. Okay, so you get 3 fourths plus 4 eighths plus 6 fourths plus 7 eighths plus 8 fourths. You get 7.125. For spinner B, they're all one third. So I get two times one third, five times one third, twenty times one third. If you calculate this out, I get two thirds plus five thirds plus twenty thirds. That's twenty seven over three. That equals nine. So I already know spinner B is the one I should choose because it has a higher expected value. But if I played ten games, I would expect seventy one point two five points for spinner A and 90 points for spinner B. So spinner B had the higher total, I would choose spinner B.